Welcome to this uh, Law in the America series. Uh, We're going to wait what, 10 seconds, 15, waiting for other participants to join and then we will start. Thank you. Okay, good evening to everyone uh, and welcome to this uh, Law in the Americas uh, series webinar. Uh, that today we have this very hot topic that we have titled Driver Fights, Rights and Recognition, Up Based Right, Hail Workers and Labor Law in the US and, and Latin America. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to me to introduce uh, our panelists today our speakers, uh, Professor Federico Rosenbaum Carli from Uruguay. He's a, an associate professor of the law at Universidad Católica de Uruguay. Um, professor Pamela Isbanariu, uh, assistant professor of law at the University of Dayton School of Law. So it is a, it's a great pleasure to have both of them uh, in order to discuss such an interesting topic. Uh, but before turning the floor uh, to to Pamela, I, I would like to make some uh, organizational details clarified. Uh, we're going to take uh, Q&A at the end of uh, both uh, panelist session, and you can post your Q&A in the feature Q&A that you have uh, in the bottom below. Uh, also, uh, an interpretation feature is uh, allowed here. Uh, just uh, uh, near the Q&A question, you will have a, an interpretation button. And if you click, it will translate into Spanish if you are interested in, in getting an interpretation service or it's already available. So uh, thank you very much for joining today. And I, I will turn the floor to Pamela. Pamela, thank you for being here. And the floor is yours. So let me sh share the, share my screen. I have a very simple, um, simple PowerPoint today. But can I can I ask folks a question? Is everybody? I can't see everybody, but um, Uber and Lyft obviously have been in the news. Driver protests have been in the news. I wanted to get a sense um, from folks who are here in the audience of you know, your, your thoughts, sort of where, where is everybody at on um, why we think drivers are protesting, why um, Uber and Lyft drivers have been organizing for the past couple of years. Can people, can people talk? I don't know if that's allowed in this configuration. Uh, ideally, ideally they will post a Q&A at, at, at the end. Okay. So hopefully folks have been seeing this stuff in the news since I can't see you guys while I'm talking. Um, but a lot of this started as soon as Uber and Lyft um, hit the ground running, right? Very soon after um, Uber came on the scene, you had drivers that were reporting that they were making below minimum wage, right? that they didn't have the ability to organize. And part of the reason and the reason why when we see all of this on the news, all of this is always, all of these debates are contextualized in this larger conversation of whether drivers are independent contractors or whether drivers are employees has to do with the way um, labor law is structured in the US. So your right to receive a minimum wage your right to organize and form a union, right? Um, your ability to collect unemployment, um, all has to do with whether or not you're classified as an independent contractor or an employee. Um, and employees get all of those rights and benefits and independent contractors don't. So one of the main issues um, is of course, drivers essentially pushing for, for the last, um, 
for the last couple of years pushing for employee status um, in part to have their rights to minimum wage recognized, to have their rights to receive overtime be recognized, right? Um, and so this is the sort of the larger context. In California, where all of this started, the presentation is going to focus on California, um, looking at Proposition 22. At the very beginning, we had a couple of cases where drivers essentially said we're misclassified, right? The reason um, that we're not receiving minimum wages, that we haven't been able to organize this specifically because we've been misclassified as independent contractors when we're actually employees. Um, but all of those cases essentially settled. And so I wanted to just start by going over just the basic idea if folks are not familiar with our different classification tests in the US for employee and independent contractor classifications, and then start talking about what's happened recently in California with Proposition 22. So depending on the jurisdiction you're in, right, the way in which we test for, or determine whether someone is an employee or an independent contractor differs, um, which makes it a mess in terms of litigation for drivers who are trying to push for employee classification. But we have three basic doctrinal tests. The common law of agency test, which focuses essentially on how much control the employer has over the way in which the worker performs the work. So the more control the employer has, the more likely it is that the, that the worker will be considered an employee. Economic realities tests usually includes in the common law um, of agency tests that essentially forms the core of all of our tests or most of them. The economic realities test focuses number one on that control test, but also adds um, a couple of different, depending on your jurisdiction, a couple of different um, additional requirements, right? So if, um, if the worker depends financially on the employer, if the worker has invested um, their own money into the tools that they need or whether they borrow those from the employer um, and all of these all of the different parts of whatever the economic realities test is in the particular jurisdiction will be um, looked at to determine whether an employee is, is an independent contractor or, or whether a worker is an independent contractor or an employee. The simplest test and the one that's been in the news as of late um, for the last couple of years is the ABC test, right? So this ABC test simplifies how we determine um, employee and independent contractor status by looking at three things, right? A, B, and C here, I have them one, two, three. But number one, it takes from that common law of agency test, whether the worker is free from the direction of con or control um, of the hiring entity, whether the worker performs the work on the, the hiring entity's premises, and whether the worker is engaged in uh, an independent trade, right? Separable from the, or separate from the hiring entity's business. So when we look at what happened in California after all of these misclassification tests um, or misclassification suits were settled, there was a case, um, Dynamex, right? Uh, that the Supreme Court of California decided. So Dynamex was, not um, a, a platform company. It was a nationwide offline same day courier, but it had a lot in common with Uber and Lyft, right? So it was an on-demand same day pickup, pickup service available to the public. And it essentially converted its drivers from employee status to independent contractor status. Why would they do that? Because they wanted to shift the cost, right? They wanted to lower their costs, shift the costs of vehicle maintenance, of liability, fuel tolls um, to the workers, right? To, to get more money and sort of put all of the burden and liability on, on workers. So you had two Dynamex employees who sued on their own behalf as well as the class of workers alleging that they've been misclassified. And for folks who were involved in the Uber and Lyft misclassification suits, Uber and Lyft, the workers themselves, all of the um, 
organizations and unions that had partnered up um, with drivers focused on essentially what ended up being um, the Supreme Court's incorporation of the ABC test um, into California law. So when we look at the similarities between Dyn Dynamex and Uber and Lyft drivers, we can list them out in order to, to figure out sort of why an offline company became sort of the centerpiece of platform work or, right, or, or the platform cases. So first, when you look at ride hail companies like Uber and Lyft, um, Dynamex obtained its own clients and it set its own rates, just like Uber and Lyft, right? Uber and Lyft, are, are the ones that collect the passenger lists um, and assign drivers to the different rides, assign the rates that the drivers are going to be paid, assign the rates that the passengers are going to pay for the service. Um, On-demand drivers for Dynamex were assigned um, each of their rides, right, or each of their deliveries by Dynamex, same as Uber and Lyft. Um, and then when you look at what the drivers were required to do for Dynamex, Dynamex drivers were required to provide their own vehicles, they were required to pay for all their transportation costs, right, tolls, fuel, uh, vehicle maintenance. And so all of this was similar to Uber and Lyft drivers who do the same thing, right? They either own or rent their own vehicles, they pay for their own tolls, they pay, pay for their own fuel. And so in resolving the case, one of the preliminary questions was whether the prevailing multi-factor standard, right, set forth in Borello, um, which is what came before Dynamex, was the only appropriate standard for under California law for distinguishing employees and independent contractors. And so what the court did is the court looked to the purpose of wage and hour laws more generally at the federal level and then at the state level. And so the Dynamex court said, the reason we have these laws, the reason we have wage and hour laws, number one is to protect against the, the evils and dangers resulting from wages that are too low, that don't allow people to buy the bare necessities, right, of life that, that we need. Um, and to protect against wages that are so low that they force workers to earn, to, to work really long hours, right, in a, in a way that's injurious to their health. The court acknowledged that the wage and hour laws were adopted specifically in recognition of the fact that individual workers generally possess less bargaining power than a hiring entity, right, than a hiring business. Um, and because of that, because of the worker's fundamental need to earn an income, um, workers are generally going to be vulnerable to making decisions based on the fact that they, they need money, they need to support their families, right? So that need, that financial need can lead them to accept work for substandard wages, right? Or substandard working conditions. Um, and so in thinking about sort of the, the, the foundation of labor and employment law, the foundation of wage and hour law, um, the California Supreme Court decided in, in Dynamex that what it needed to do was it needed to recognize a broad um, a broad definition of who is an employee. So what it did is it incorporated this or it adopted this ABC test um, specifically for wage and hour. And so it looked at number one, whether the, the, the worker's free from control, from the employer's control, whether the worker performs the work on premises, right, or off premises, and whether the workers engaged in some sort of other business, right, or the business, um, the business specifically of the hiring entity. So when we look at how drivers, um, how ride hail drivers sort of match up to this A, B, and C, we see that at least according to the state of California, um, who tried to make the case for, and eventually succeeded, tried to make the case for the fact that rideshare drivers, in fact, are employees under this ABC test, the way in which the state argued was, number one, looking at this A, do Uber and Lyft retain control over drivers? 
at least Uber and Lyft's argument was, no, drivers decide when they're going to work. Drivers decide when they're going to stop working. Nobody's forcing drivers to accept a particular fare. Um, but with respect to Part A, the state argued that Uber and Lyft, in fact, did retain control over the driver's work. Why? Because then they had the ability to fire employees. Um, they controlled which assignments, right, which rides to give um, employees. They unilaterally, Uber and Lyft, unilaterally set passenger fares to determine how much drivers were paid. They restricted drivers from negotiating fares, right, from setting quality standards, um, monitor drivers uh, for speed, for compliance, and discipline drivers in other ways, right, that weren't meeting these standards. And outside of this, both Uber and Lyft track their drivers. They require their drivers to notify the companies at every single um, step of the trip, including arrival, when you pick someone up, um, when you end the trip. Um, and then it also suggested that, or the state also suggested that companies were monitoring and controlling driver behavior while drivers were logged on, directing drivers to take specific routes, um, admonishing drivers or, or, or punishing drivers who left the, the, the route that was identified by Uber or Lyft as the one they needed to take. Um, they reserve the right to adjust driver payments um, if they took different routes that Uber and Lyft thought were in, inefficient. Um, and additionally, the state argued that Uber and Lyft controlled or limited the amount of information drivers received. Um, and this is true when I, I did field work in South Florida. This is true essentially globally. Um, for the most part, drivers don't receive any information. So when they're sent on a um, when they're sent on a trip, they don't know where they're they're who they're picking up, um, how long the ride is going to be, and they're right encouraged to accept without knowing how long they're gonna work for, where they're going to be going, who's gonna be in their car, how much they're gonna be earning. With respect to part B, right, are drivers engaged in work that's within um, the course of the company's business? The state said Uber and Lyft drivers are engaged in work that's in the course of the company's business. The provision of on-demand rides is the only business that Uber and Lyft have. Um, and so that immediate availability of and, and, and temporal convenience of an on-demand driver, of an on-demand ride, that is the service that every single driver is essentially providing to its passengers. So the drivers, Cal, the, the state of California contended, were essentially integrated and essential into or, or to Uber and Lyft's businesses. Um, and the state argued that they wouldn't exist, the businesses wouldn't exist at all without the driver's labor. So the state also asserted that the drivers were using the app provided by the employer, right, whether it be Uber or Lyft, to drive the company's passengers around for the purpose of generating their income. And after collecting the fare from their passengers, Uber and Lyft essentially would pay their workers, pay the drivers for providing that on-demand service, that on, those on-demand rides um, to Uber and Lyft's passengers, to their passengers keeping the majority of the money. With respect to part C, are drivers engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, or business? The state asserted that drivers were not engaged in an independently established trade. Um, to this end, the state essentially argued that drivers had and have no exclusive means to connect with um, passengers, right? To request um, or provide companies on-demand rides by themselves, right outside of the app. Um, the state also noted that companies unilaterally, unilaterally determine passenger fares, driver pay, driver's territory, where the driver is going to be allowed to drive, where the driver is going to be sent, um, without regard to right driver preference, without regard to driver convenience. Um, it noted that the drivers don't have the ability to decline or cancel rides without um, being punished, right? And potentially risking deactivation from the app, essentially potentially risking getting fired. So the state asserted, the state of California asserted that drivers are prevented from engaging in any sort of an entrepreneurial activity um, or decision-making that would be consistent with 
independent business ownership. And so when the Dynamex court decided that, okay, this is essentially what, um, this is essentially ABC uh, is the test that we're using now. This is relevant to wage and hours. Soon after that, the state of California codified the ABC test into law under um, AB5, um, which essentially said a, the ABC test is the one that we're going to use in order to determine um, employee status in the state of California. And so what did Uber and Lyft do? Um, did they do what we would expect to follow the law um, and reclassify their drivers that they had previously misclassified as independent contractors? No, of course not. That's not what they did. Um, they essentially wrote their own law and put it forward um, for the November 2020 election, um, and it was Proposition 22. So essentially Uber, Lyft, Postmates, DoorDash all got together, um, wrote a law that essentially created a new classification and made a number of promises to drivers. And I wanted to talk about that now, um, because when we think about sort of what's going on with um, platform drivers, and platform law, Proposition 22 is sort of the, the, the main deal. So when we look at the campaign, the Yes on 22 campaign, which is essentially the campaign that was paid for by Uber, Lyft, Postmates, DoorDash, it was the most expensive campaign in US history. So we have in total monetary contributions, 112 um, million dollars, over $112 million in the non-monetary contributions, um, which are also quite high with respect to driver lists, passenger lists, client lists. But in thinking about, I wanted to sort of walk through Proposition 22, what was promised um, and written into Proposition 22, um, and then what drivers actually got. And then we'll talk about it's recent, um, the recent decision by the court um, determining that it was unconstitutional. So when we look at Proposition 22, you have to think about just in terms of timeline, the California legislature creates a law saying, this is the employment classification test we're going to use. According to this employment classification test, the ABC test, Uber drivers and Lyft drivers are going to be employees. In order to evade that, Uber and Lyft and DoorDash and Postmates write this law. And here um, on this slide, I'm essentially including directly from the Yes on 22 um, website, what the promises were as written by um, the companies. So the way in which it was framed is, according to Uber Lyft, this law is here to protect the rights of drivers to essentially work as independent contractors, um, to work this flexible work, to determine what their schedule is going to be, how long they're going to work for, to preserve their access to earning opportunities, provide drivers new benefits, um, provide drivers with minimum wage earnings, um, access to healthcare. When we think about the timeline, this is essentially, Right after ABC um, or right after AB5 um, goes into effect, Uber and Lyft put a bunch of money and Postmates and DoorDash put a bunch of money into um, this campaign fund. And right as we see the pandemic take hold in the United States, um, right as we see the BLM movement um, start to take hold in a, in a moment of extreme crisis, especially for low wage workers, Uber, Lyft and, and DoorDash and Postmates um, construct this narrative and the narrative um, becomes a big part of how, at least I think, um, it eventually gets passed, right? Because it's put to vote in, in the middle of a time of extreme economic crisis. 
when folks need to be earning income. And so we're going to walk through essentially what the what the narrative crafted by these platform companies was. Essentially, they're selling they're selling the idea that platform work or driving for Uber and Lyft, whether it's delivery driving or passenger driving, um, is a micro entrepreneurial opportunity, right? That's going to help low wage workers out. Um, it's going to help people of color out. It's going to help people who have been let go from their jobs, um, who need some sort of additional side work in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle of this economic crisis. When we look at the spending, um, we can see here as soon as um, California signs this worker protection law sort of right coalescing at the same time as the BLM protest, this all makes sense in a little bit, um, is when there's a tremendous amount of, of money coming into the campaign and then money going out in terms of expenditures. So when we think of how Uber and Lyft, Postmates, DoorDash spent their money on this campaign, one of the things to highlight is a tremendous amount of money was spent on misinformation um, and informing drivers, sort of focusing, especially on drivers of color, um, focusing on convincing drivers of color that Prop 22 was um, in their best interest, right? So Uber and Lyft and you know, DoorDash, Postmates started engaging in a tremendous amount of racial justice work, um, putting up billboards. If you support racial justice, vote no on Proposition 22 um, is the, the workers' response. But if you look behind the workers, uh, Uber essentially started putting billboards right in the middle of our BLM um, protests. If you support racism, delete Uber. Um, so was sort of co-opting racial justice language, co-opting worker justice language and framing Proposition 22 as if it was um, a, a piece of racial justice um, itself, right? Was, was a bill designed to achieve racial justice, achieve economic justice was essentially the, the framing that the platform companies were going for. So when you look at the expenditures on slate mailers, we hear, I don't know if everybody can see, but slate mailers are essentially those, you know, the postcards that you receive in the mail um, that tell you who to vote for. They were sending things out for, you know, the, Latin, the Latinos voters guide, the progressive voters guide, um, sending these slate mailers out, suggesting that Prop 22 was supported by Latino voters, supported by black voters, supported by, um, progressive voters in order to confuse the, the California voting public. Um, and so a lot of this was going on sort of at the same time as these larger claims to worker justice, um, which sort of lead into how they framed um, the, the changes that Proposition 22 would bring with respect to wages. And, um, and sort of worker benefits. So Proposition 22 essentially was sold by these companies as this is going to guarantee workers, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, 120% of the minimum wage. But the reality was it only counted um, the amount of time when uh, workers were actually had, had a passenger for ride hail drivers. They had a passenger in the car, which excludes 40 to 60% of the time that workers are actually working. Um, they're signed into the app. They just don't have a, a passenger in the car. That 40 to 60% of, of their work time under AB5, right, under the California legislature's um, design bill was paid right? And additionally, they would have received overtime um, or they would receive overtime now under AB5. And so even though it was sold as guaranteeing this 120% of the minimum wage, the reality was what it really guaranteed was about $5.64 an hour, right? Which is sub-minimum wage. Um, when you look at Proposition 22 and its impact on organizing, it specifically included 
a provision that eliminated the right of app-based drivers and delivery drivers to organize collectively. And it prevented the California legislature from establishing its own collective bargaining um, regime for ride hail drivers, uh, which the California legislature was allowed to do. Um, and I included the, the language of the statute there. With discrimination, it essentially narrowed um, the ability of drivers to put forth the discrimination claim. Um, but that's uh, if anybody's interested, I can provide more information on, on discrimination. We'll just focus on wages and organizing here. And the other thing that Proposition 22 did is it essentially created a completely different third way or this third classification outside of what we have generally considered the classification test for employee, classification test for independent contractors, when it created this app-based driver um, classification and accompanying test. So according to section 7451 on, on PADSA on Proposition 22, an app-based driver is an independent contractor as long as these um, four elements were met. Right, the network company doesn't unilaterally prescribe specific dates and times um, when the worker is going to work or a minimum number of hours. The network company doesn't require the app-based driver to accept any specific rideshare service or delivery service request. The network company doesn't restrict app-based drivers from performing rideshare services from another company, and the network company doesn't restrict app-based drivers from working any other jobs. So. When we look at, and I pulled this from rigging the gig, the differences between the ballot proposition, Proposition 22, and this was prepared before um, Proposition 22 went into effect and before Proposition 22 was declared unconstitutional. But so you can review it later, it outlines right under current state and federal law, so under AB5 on the left, and then under the ballot proposition, under Proposition 22 on the right. Right, so it's clearly a deterioration of worker wages, um, right? Sort of limitations on the worker's ability to organize, um, leaves out sick days, leaves out the ability of workers to access um, overtime, uh, unemployment compensation, disability insurance, included extremely confusing language on health insurance in the middle of a pandemic. Um, that left out the majority of workers who thought they would be um, able to get health insurance under Proposition 22. And just briefly before I close, I wanted to focus on the language. So how, when we think about um, how Uber and Lyft and DoorDash and Postmates were able to convince voters, because obviously the Proposition 22 passed, how they were able to convince voters that this piece of legislation that was um, obviously not, you know, not in their benefit in terms of increasing wages um, or, or allowing them to organize, um, how it convinced them to, to vote for it. And a lot of this had to do with the framing. So I did a discourse analysis of all of the uh, information available on the Yes on 22 campaign website um the official campaign website and so when we look at how um, the issues were framed what we see is uber lyft doordash postmates framing the work as flexible it's a flexible work opportunity you can earn extra income you make great money um, that replaces any income you you might have lost um, it allows you to cover your expensive make ends meet and it specifically focused on people who were experiencing a tremendous need, right? And vulnerable, um, low wage workers, communities of color um, in its text, right? So in all of the texts in Yes on 22. And it also specifically outlined, it highlighted the fact that all of this extra work um, that was, at least according to the companies, um, going to bring workers a lot of money, it was necessary. People really needed it in the time of emergency, in the pandemic, right? Um, during these really, really difficult times. 
with high unemployment, right, in the middle of a recession. When you look at its emphasis on communities of color, on small businesses, right, especially um, minority-owned restaurants, minority-owned businesses, the framing of all of the materials, so out of the flyers, you know, news articles um, that was sent out by Yes on 22, focused on the fact that it would help these communities, right, help them survive, help them stay afloat um, when times were tough, right, in the middle of the pandemic when essentially everything was being locked down. Um, when we look at how Uber and Lyft and Postmates and DoorDash framed AB5, we see a lot of um, essentially antagonistic framing suggesting that the legislature, the California legislature was biased, the California legislature sort of had it out for, was targeting platform companies um, in order to threaten drivers, right? To take away their ability to um, work flexible hours, to choose independent work, none of which was, was true, right? Uh, AB5 specifically included um, uh, a line or a provision essentially saying that nothing in AB5 prohibited workers from working flexible schedules or choosing their own hours. Um, and essentially was framed to force, right, AB5 is essentially forcing drivers to work um, as employees when they don't want to do that, um, trying to confuse workers that this shift from um, the status quo to AB5 would essentially require them to work set shifts, right, set hours. Um, and then this last, um, I see you, Pablo, back on uh, on the video, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. And then when we look at um, how lawmakers were being framed, how the, the city attorneys, the legislators, um, the politicians who were pushing for uh, worker justice, pushing for minimum wage protections, pushing for um, the ability of workers to be able to unionize, the framing from Uber and Lyft is essentially that, you know, the legislature, the, the, the government of California is waging war on low wage workers, waging war on workers of color, um, waging war on vulnerable workers. Um, and they're trying to essentially have it out for um, platform companies, right? They're trying to put platform companies out of business. And so when we look at um, just recently, this year in August, the last, uh, the decision in, in Castellanos versus California essentially said one of the, it wasn't the deceit um, that, that sort of uh, made the court hold Proposition 22 unconstitutional, but it was specifically the fact that um, the Proposition 22 required seven eighths majority for the California legislature to amend the law um, because it limited the ability of the legislature to define what app-based drivers were. Um, and that part wasn't severable from the rest of the statute. And essentially it, requ it required all future labor law in California to be made in accordance with this law that you know Uber, Lyft, um, and Postmates and DoorDash had written itself. Uh, so the court recognized that it only protected the economic interests of the platform companies and not the workers. Um, and just to last closing line, Massachusetts has uh, sort of a copycat bill from Proposition 22 um, going up in the 2022 election, um, and copycat bills are you know being recreated um, in different states right now. So certainly this is not, not the end of Castellanos versus California or the end of this larger conversation of sort of platform designed, um, legislation being put forth specifically framed as, you know, worker justice bills, um, or racial justice bills. And that's it. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Pamela. That was a wonderful and an extremely interesting presentation. So thank you very much uh, for introducing that interesting and, and I would say hot topic. So um, just for the audience, remember that you have the, the Q&A feature uh, below on the, on the bottom sections.
so that you can just type your questions and, uh, and we will discuss those at the end. Both panelists may have the chance to answer the, uh, the, uh, the questions. Uh, I will turn now to Federico um, so that we can hear his presentation. So Federico, if you are ready, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pablo. Let me share my presentation. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the University of Dayton and obviously Pamela for the invitation. Uh, I want to share some thoughts about the judicial decisions in Uruguay. Um, firstly, I would like to, to share some, some uh, images in the, in the presentation. I hope you, you can see them. Uh, Pamela has reduced uh, the topic very, very, very Exactly. So simply, I would like to introduce some, some words. It's, it's very uh, obvious that in the context of a growing and increasing incorporation of technologies in the world of work, new forms of employment are being developed using digital platforms. And Uber is only one of the uh, examples around the world. This implies hiring people directly, not owners of companies, often referred to as collaborators, partners, to carry out services offered to the customers indefinitely. And certainly in, in the context, context of this type of business, the ways of working have been organized uh, and structured in most cases to be formally removed from the regular, regulatory scope of labor law. And in this sense, the design of this business models is built on two central ideas related to the legal nature of the activity of such businesses and to the legal relation, relationship between the service provider and your driver, for example, and the digital platform itself. <clears throat> and many digital platforms, companies, consider themselves to be providers of information services whose activity is limited to intermediation between the user or the client requesting a specific service within um, that platform and the provider of the service itself. And these companies tend to self-label themselves as platforms uh, developed in that collaborative economy. And in this line of, of postulates, if the company concentrates its activity on the development of a product, such as an application or a digital platform, and does not provide any additional service, it will not be necessary for it to have dependent workers to provide a different activity that will not constitute or integrate its line of business. It's, it's pretty obvious. But those who provide the underlying service are considered by these companies to be self-employed, uh, independent contractors, as you uh, know uh, in your country. In this context, Uber has not recognized nor recognizes its drivers as dependent workers, but instead considers them to be self-employed, independent contractors, and refers to them as uh, driving partners. No? And it is precisely with this framework that the Uruguayan Labor Appeal Court was asked to define the nature of the relationship between Uber and its drivers and determine whether the, the latter are subordinate or independent workers. In other words, whether they fall within the scope of labor law. It's pretty obvious and Pamela has already outlined this idea and this crucial issue that it's a substantive uh, problem uh, on the on the on the bottom, no, the system or the procedure for determining the existence of the employment relationship. In Uruguay, the court, the the, the labor appeal court, uses ILO recommendation number one hundred and eighty eight to solve the case and in, uh, also stresses that the existence of the employment relationship should be determined according to the facts related to the execution of the work. It's applying the principle of 
primacy of the reality and the remuneration, remuneration of the worker, regardless of what the parties agreed to in the formal documents, for example. And secondly, in interpreting ILO recommendation, the court emphasizes that subordination or dependence is not only or, 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 or even longer a necessary and exclusive condition, but instead the court uh, considers a mere sufficient condition. Basically highlights the following indicators in recommendation uh, 198 of ILO as applicable in the current case that, anal that analyzes analyzed the, 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 the facts in, in that case. No? Firstly, some pro subordinate status arguments, uh, mainly the first one is the benefit from the work provided by the driver. Under ILO, ILO recommendation, it is sufficient that the person to whom the work is delivered has assumed for the most part of the risk of its execution. The important element in this indicator is the ex expansion of the concept of beneficiary. Indeed, the recommendation does not exclude the implicit possibility that the person who works is responsible for part of the costs, at least. The second one, it's what Pamela highlighted uh, in the second uh, condition of ABC test, it's the integration of the driver into the Uber organization. Uber argues that um, it provides, provides the technology that Uber, that drivers uses. And when analyzing the issue of the integration of the driver in the organization of the company, the court indicated that the driver does not organize any stage of the Uber production proce process, the, tra the trans transportation process, uh, thus, the driver is only a link in the production process organized and directed by Uber to which he submits. The driver joins the company occupying a specific function in the line with the Uber business model and without the driver's work transporting the passengers, the Uber business basically would not exist in fact. The third one, it's uh, carrying out work according to instructions or under the control of another person. The court distinguished the activity of a self-employed worker, an independent contractor, from that of a subordinate worker and clarifies that the former organizes and executes the tasks according to their own judgment uh, without uh, prejudice that um, the fact that the principle of the work controls the results of it. Uh, the second, however, like the driver, it executes the transport service in accordance with the, extra the instructions that arise from the um, contract uh, unilaterally provided by Uber and uh, is su subject to Uber's control, in fact. In short, the company directs and control all drivers' activity. It can even respond with actions that affect the driver, such as suspending the access to the, to the app. And this obviously represents a modality of exercising the sanctioning power typical of an employer. The fourth one, it's the supply of the tools. Uber partially supplies the tools and makes the technology application and its entire organization available. And the driver only only partially contributes the needed tools, such as the car and the communication device in, su in some cases. On the other hand, other pro self-employment status arguments, basically the court uh, highlighted indicators that are not in line with the classification of Uber drivers as dependent workers. These include, for example, the lack of proof of the personal execution, execution of the passenger transportation, given that the driver in that case, for example, had registered two cars that were also registered by other drivers and the type of relationship between uh, 
those drivers was not explained or tested in, in that case in particular. It, finally, to, to share some conclusions about the court decision, uh, to resolve the employment status question, the appeal court uses these indicators and weights the arguments for and against the subordinate employment or self-employment status to determine whether the Uber driver is to be qualified as a subordinate or independent worker. And in doing so, it uses a holistic evaluation of all criteria pertinent to an employment relationship to determine where, whether a person qualifies as a subordinate worker. Ultimately, this analysis uh, consists in applying what Bernd was uh, defines as the typological method in determining the existence of the employment relationship, recognizing that the concept of um, subordinate worker is simply a type, meaning that it is not necessary to meet all the criteria in each individual case to qualify a worker as an employee. And thus, concludes that the following facts uh, point to a classification of the Uber driver as subordinate worker. The first one, the driver does not organize the way in which the, uh, the work is carried out. The second one, the alienation from the market as the Uber driver does not control users' demand of the transport service and lacks the minimum power of access into the market or to establish and control a relationship with the demanding users of the transport service. Uh, the third one, the Uber driver did not determine the rate and does not determine the rate. Um, its adjustments, its changes, and the cost of canceling the service by, by the user. In self-employment, although the contractor has the right to control the results, as a rule, the manner of the execution is left to the expertise of the person hired. On the contrary, in the case at issue, uh, the driver does not organize the way he carries out the work based on his expertise, but rather he carries out step-by-step step following the instructions by Uber. This implies the existence of a subordinate relationship. And in short, the court concludes that the facts that point to the qualification of the relationship as a self-employed, partial ab absence of economic risk due to the driver's contribu contributions of work tools and the absence of personal performance of the tasks are less important than those, those that point out to an employment relationship. And in this, in this sense, the judgment con concludes that the absence of freedom to carry out the job in the way the drivers chooses excludes the possibility of qualifying his status as a self-employed worker. To sum up and uh, not uh, exceed in, in time, some final thoughts and, and perspectives. ILO recommendation number 198, it constitutes an international instrument of superlative importance for resolving problems related to the determination of a dependent employment relationship. Based on the indicate, indicators enshrined in this ILO recommendation, nation, national courts have resolved this type of conflicts considering the most important criterion uh, as to be the integration of the worker in the organizational structure of the company. This indicator in the current case means that if weren't for the work of Uber drivers, the company's purpose would not be fulfilled. It's, it's obvious. It is therefore essential to have these workers for Uber to carry out its core activity, the transportation service. However, it could also be, be argued that the main criterion to distinguish between self-employment and employment relationship uh, could lie on whether the Uber driver is independent in carrying out the job and substantially works on their own account. In other words, in determining the nature of the working relationship, the main criterion, criterion 
should be the analysis of the autonomy a worker has in carrying out the work. And in particular, the presence of what we in Latin America call agenidad in its various meanings. meanings. <clears throat> For example, determining who has the benefits and bears the risk of an economic activity, who owns the methods of production, who owns the brand and participates directly in the market. And last, the integration in the organizational structure of the company. These indicators relate to the employer's powers of organization, management, control, and disciplinary, uh, which are char characteristic of subordination uh, and subordinate relationships. In this, in this context of activities carried out through a digital platform such as Uber, it could then be argued that the influential control of the company over the service and the way the service is provided by platform workers is uh, decisive in determining the employment status of these workers. Uh, two final uh, remarks. Uh, will the intervention of the justice be enough? Will the intervention of the legislature be necessary? The legeferenda proposals should aim to solving naturally the substantive uh, problem generated in the work developed through digital platforms. For example, based on a creation of a presumption of employment, and secondly, containing detailed aspects that the presumed employer would have to prove in case of pretending to exclude the worker from the protection of labor law. Uh, to conclude, it can be pointed out that although this judgment may have shed some light on the debate in Uruguay, however, much remains to be discussed on this topic in the future. It is difficult to say whether this ruling could operate as a kickoff towards new claims at a judicial level, but at least a labor appeal court has already marked its position and a uh, Maybe it, this, it, it will be potentially important in, in our country. Thank you for, for your time. Well, thank you very much, Federico. That was a, a great presentation too. Uh, very interesting cases and the ones that you're having put away. Uh, so I, I will open the floor to, to questions. Uh, we have one uh, in the chat. Uh, Harrison says, what I say is uh, articles, could you recommend reading to gain a better understanding of Proposition 22 and the right share workers struggle? I think that's for Pamela. I don't know, Pamela, if you may can read in suggestions or perhaps if you have a quote you wanted to type it. Sure. Um, Vina Duval just wrote a piece, it's called the Racial Wage Code. Um, her last name is spelled D-U-B-A-L, um, first name V-E-E-N-A. Um, and I think it's a great piece and it also contextualizes it in um, the, the background, especially with respect to workers of color um, in labor law in the United States. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I, I see that you are typing, Pamela, so thank you. Thank you for uh, taking that question from Harrison. Uh, any other questions to, to the panelists? Uh, well, I, I have one for, for, for Federico. In fact, it's for both. Um, a very short one. I, I don't know um, what your thought could be about uh, if you have a worker that is in a relationship with Uber, but they are also uh, taking rights from other kind of, uh, not necessarily platforms. Yeah. In Latin America, we have something pretty common. I think that you have it in Uruguay, uh, like uh, private companies offering right, we call it remiserias, uh, which is something very from South America, I guess. Um, so what if you have this guy that usually is working for these private companies, completely registered, completely under label law, local label law, but occasionally, 
takes right from Uber or some, some other app. Uh, would you consider that also this would be a labor relationship? I, I could uh, take that, that question, Paulo. Uh, what happens in Uruguay, it's a bit um, maybe different from other countries in Latin America, as Uber is regulated in our country. Uh, a, a driver must um, open, uh, uh, must comply with some formal uh, requirements from the state. Uh, one each, uh, it's opening a, an, an enterprise, uh, a personal enterprise, and, and paying for the taxes of that enterprise. So it is not um, uh, under-regulated, that, that activity. Uh, but going to your, to your question itself, uh, it is not an, an exclusion of the, relation, of the dependent relationship if one person uh, develops the activity also in another company, being that an app-based company or not, like a remiseria, for example, for, for instance, uh, the, the exclusivity is not an essential element for the determining determine the existence of the relationship or, or, or subordinate relationship in our country. It's only one of the, uh, the, the, the indicators to, 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 to pay attention, but it's not the, the important one in that case. Okay, thank you very much, Federico. That was a, a very clear answer. Uh, yeah, I think it's pretty similar that we have in, in, in Argentina. Um, in fact, we had just a one, once a month ago case law also here saying that uh, a labor relationship exists with an app. It was not Uber, but was a very similar one. Okay, so thank you both for those extremely uh, uh, interesting presentation. I'm, I'm not seeing any, any other questions on, on the chat. So uh, right now I'm going to give the floor to Margaret Ioannidis. Uh, she is the, the director of the online LLM program of the University of Dayton School of Law. So it is a pleasure to have Margaret here with us. So Margaret, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pablo, and thanks to everyone who joined us on this Friday evening, and thank you, professors, for your excellent presentations. I really enjoyed both of them as well. Uh, this seminar series is actually part of the internationalization efforts of University of Dayton School of Law's online LLM program. Uh, Dayton Law has historically offered and continues to offer an on-campus LLM program, but starting in 2019, we actually began offering a fully online LLM option focused on US law and legal practice. The full online LLM degree can be completed within one year or less. Uh, no travel to the United States is required and we are offering generous partial tuition scholarships, making our online LLM one of the most affordable in the US. Uh, our online LLM program has broad appeal for those of you who might be interested in gaining a better understanding of common law and US law in particular, expanding your network of lawyers and professors from around the world, and establishing a path to bar eligibility in certain jurisdictions in the United States. We currently have about 80 students around the world participating in the program. I actually saw a few in tonight's webinar. Our next semester begins on January 6th. Um, so for any of you who might be interested in learning more, I encourage you to reach out to me directly or visit our website at go.udayton.edu forward slash online LLM. My contact information is included there. Our priority scholarship deadline is November 1st and the final deadline for January is on December 1st. I'd also like to take this opportunity to invite all of you to join Professor Ianello and myself in our Law and Technology Seminar Series that actually launched yesterday. And our next webinar is coming up next Thursday, October 28th at 11.30 a.m. So thanks again for this opportunity, for joining us this evening, and back to you, Professor Ianello. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you for let everybody know about these uh, upcoming events and uh, thank everyone for uh, uh, being here today. A special thanks to uh, the panelists.
and a special thank to uh, the University of Dayton School of Law, Jordan, Walter, uh, organizing and pulling all this together. So uh, it has been a pleasure to have all of you here. And I think that uh, with this, we uh, have conclude the, the event. Thank you everybody for joining today. And I hope to see you in following events. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye bye.